In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. peace be with you. And with your spirit. We gather to celebrate these sacred mysteries, knowing that God's love and mercy is more than our sin sickness. Let us ask for forgiveness. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty and merciful God, that we may be, in truth, receive a share in the resurrection of Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The crowd of Philippians joined in and showed its hostility to Paul and Silas. So the magistrates had them stripped and ordered them to be flogged. They were given many lashes and then thrown into prison, and the jailer was told to keep a close watch on them. So, following his instructions, he threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Late that night, Paul and Silas were praying and singing God's praises while the other prisoners listened. Suddenly, there was an earthquake that shook the prison to its foundations. All the doors flew open, and the chains fell from all the prisoners. When the jailer woke and saw the doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to commit suicide, <coughs> presuming that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted at the top of his voice, Don't do yourself any harm. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, then rushed in, threw himself trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas, and escorted them out, saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They told him, Become a believer in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, and your household too. Then they preached the word of the Lord to him and to all his family. Late as it was, he took them to wash their wounds and was baptized then and there with all his household. Afterwards, he took them home and gave them a meal, and the whole family celebrated their conversion to belief in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You stretch out your hand and save me, O Lord. You stretch out your hand and save me, O Lord. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. You have heard the words of my mouth. Before the angels, I will bless you. I will adore before your holy temple. You stretch, you stretch out, out your hand, hand and, and save, save me, O Lord. Lord. I thank you for your faithfulness and love, which excel all we ever knew of you. On the day I called, you answered. You increased the strength of my soul. You, you stretched, stretched out, out your hand and, and save me, O Lord. Lord. You stretch out your hand and save me. Your hand will do all things for me. Your love, O Lord, is eternal. Discard not the work of your hands. 
you stretch out your hands and save me. Send you the spirit of truth, says the Lord. He will lead you to the complete truth. Sing alleluia to the Lord. Sing alleluia to the Lord. Sing be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Now I am going to the one who sent me. Not one of you have asked, Where are you going? Yet you are sad at heart because I have told you this. Still, I must tell you the truth. It is for your own good that I am going, because unless I go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will show the world how wrong it was about sin, about who was in the right, and about judgment. About sin, proved by their refusal to believe in me. About who was in the right, proved by my going to the Father. And you're seeing me no more about judgment proved by the prince of this world being already condemned. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our text today is getting closer to the action. Huh? And uh, the action is Jesus' is leaving. And this is the second or third time that he's talking about his leaving in the farewell discourse. And, and this time, there's a, a different quality to it. He, he said before, I must leave and go, but do not be afraid. Do not, be, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me still. Now he says, I'm going to the one who sent me. And you're not asking me where I'm going, you know. But we, they've asked before, Lord, where are you going? But what he's saying now is, is important. Yet you are sad at heart because I have told you this. You are sad at heart. So the disciples now are realizing that Jesus is intending not to be with them for much longer. That he's, his intention is that he will leave them alone. And, and they're understanding how, how complex this whole thing is. So, so he takes the last night before he dies to give them a full dose of the mystical teaching that he intends for them. That, that they are in the Father and the Father is in them and, and, and the Spirit is in them and, and, and this interpenetration of Trinity, the, the, the advocate, another one, another advocate is coming. All of these mystical teachings, he's doing it on the last night before he, he leaves. And, and, and their heads are filled, their hearts are filled. They, they're reeling from the, the depth of teaching and revelation that Jesus is giving. And on top of that, he's saying to them, but I am leaving you. And so their hearts can't even take the fullness of what he's saying because their, their hearts already are distraught by the fact that he's going to be leaving them. But he goes on and he says, it is for your own good that I am going. Because unless I go, the advocate will not come to you. 
But if I go, I will send him to you. And, and we have a curious text here. Is it that Jesus and the advocate can't be in the same place at the same time? Is that it? I don't think so. Because of the things that he said about the advocate. And I don't think so because he intends for the advocate and the risen Christ to be present to the, to the church and to the disciple after the resurrection and even after Pentecost. I, I think it is that to grow in faith, we need this, this, this next step of the journey. To grow in faith, the disciples needed this next step. Remember, what they're about to witness is, is a complete an annihilation of Jesus. The, the annihilation of his reputation, of, of the hope that he was the Son of God, of the hope that he was the Messiah and the chosen one of Israel, the hope that he was a righteous man. All of this is annihilated in the day that is going to follow this teaching. Because as, as he faces the cross, every hope they had is going to be dashed. Everyone. And, and in, in, in this sense, I think what we're dealing with here is, is the fact that it will require the Spirit to reveal to the disciples and to us the truth of who Jesus is. That the first work of the Spirit is revealing the truth of Jesus Christ. The truth about him and the truth that he is and the fact that he is the truth. And that revelation is the first work of the Holy Spirit. We think of the Spirit leading us and to, to sanctity and, and leading us with power gifts and leading us with, with all kinds of things. But what if the first gift of the Holy Spirit is a revelation of who Jesus really is? Not the fact that he existed as a man, but the fact that this man is Son of God, is who he claims to be. And, and I think that that's what we're playing with inside of this text. And that's why the next piece is so important. When he says, and when the Spirit comes to you, he will show the world how wrong it was about sin and about who was in the right and about judgment about sin proved by their refusal to believe in me. About who is in the right proved by, their, by my going to the Father and your seeing me no more. About judgment proved by the prince of this world being already condemned. A real curious statement. Except that we're talking about or we're understanding it in the light of what he's saying. In John's gospel, John has a, a curious notion of sin. Throughout the whole gospel, from, from the prologue where he talks about, and though the true light came into the world, people did not believe the light. Though the true light came into the world, they did not believe the light. Why? Well, because they preferred darkness to the light. And from the very beginning of the gospel, John is, is juxtaposing the, the light that has come and the reception of the light. And for John, sin, the ultimate sin, is rejecting the truth of who Jesus Christ is. That the true light has come into the world and people have refused the true light, preferring their darkness instead. And that rejection of Jesus Christ is the dominant understanding of sin in John's gospel. And so when he, say, when he says here, he will show the world how wrong it was about sin because the world believed that Jesus was a sinful man. They, remember, they wanted to stone him for blasphemy because they believed that he was blaspheming against God when he claimed to be God. And we have several texts, including the, the text of the man born blind, including the raising of Lazarus from the dead. They wanted to kill him on, on, for these texts. Um, they... they, they so many of the, the stories in John, they end up wanting to kill him when he, when he gives them the sign. Rather than seeing the sign as pointing to his divinity, they see the sign as pointing to his blasphemy. And, 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 and their total misreading and misunderstanding of, of, of him as a sinner. And, and when he says, who is right about sin? Well, who was right? Was it Jesus who was right? 
as a righteous man? Or was it the, the Pharisees who were right, who wanted to kill him because they thought he was blaspheming? Who was right about sin? And he goes on to say, and who was, and who was in the right? Who was the righteous one? You have to remember that for Israel, shame for the man who hangs upon the tree. Crucifixion is not just a shameful act that we see because we, the man has been publicly humiliated by hanging so many feet above the earth, naked and tortured and brutalized. It's not just a shameful act. It's an act that makes one unrighteous because the, the scripture says it is, it is a shame for the man who hangs upon a tree. So anybody who hangs upon a tree is an unrighteous person. And, and so the, the judgment of the world, and, and by the world is the Jewish authorities. By the Jewish authorities, we are talking about the, those who had condemned him. The judgment of them was that Jesus was an unrighteous man. And, and that's why they killed him, because he's an unrighteous man. And the Spirit will reveal where righteousness really lay. The righteousness really lay in this one who is hanging on the tree, this one who is crucified, this one who is hanging for the whole world to see that, that he is shamed by the entire world. And yet in his shame, he is at right with God. And that's the paradox of the cross. And, and, and Jesus is saying that requires the Holy Spirit, that revelation requires the Holy Spirit. That Jesus is a righteous one and, and the righteous one that the unrighteous world put to, to shame, that requires the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So the, the first revelation is that Jesus is God and what, who he claims to be. The second one, he is the righteous one because he, he is the one who is at right with God, and more than that, the one who makes us at right with God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, so that whoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. He is the one through whom all life will have life, and every one of us will be saved. And so the second way the Spirit works within the, the community and the, and the individual is in helping people to understand what true righteousness is. And, and, and it's not in fulfilling of a law. It is in belief in Jesus Christ. And not just believing because the, the devils believe and they, they tremble. It is believing that he is a righteous one who makes us at right with God. And the third one is, and they show and about right and about judgment. And about judgment proved by the prince of this world being already condemned. Several times through the Gospel of John, he talks about the prince of this world. And uh, we, we've met it in the farewell discourse um, before this. And, and the, the fact that the evil believes that it triumphs. You know, there's a marvelous, um, a marvelous play called Carnival Messiah, put on by Geraldine O'Connor, God rest her soul. And the scene, the final scene of the crucifixion was, was very powerful. It, it was three Mokojumbi figures so all the figures in the, in the play are the carnival figures. There's three Moko Jumbi figures. And, and they're up on their stilts, high, high up. And, and uh, in the moment of the crucifixion and death, they, they're there and, 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 and you see the, the, the central figure just slump down and die. And, and the other two figures are there supporting so that the, the, the characters stay upright. And at the moment of the death of Christ, a black bat comes out. And, and, and starts to dance a dance of incredible jubilation, real, real jubilation. And because Satan believes that at that moment of the death of Christ, Satan believes that victory has been won, that, that the sin of the world has put to death God, because Satan knows his God. 
and, and he, Satan believes that the sin of this world has put God to death. And therefore, Satan believes that this is the greatest victory out. And, and the jubilation is incredible. And then a pink black bat comes in from the side and starts a different dance. And in, in, in that dance, there's just one final moment where the pink bat just rises up and strikes the black bat. And you see the end of Satan. And, and, and this is what the Holy Spirit has to reveal to us. That in the moment of the death of Jesus Christ is the moment of the defeat of Satan. And that's what many, many Christians don't get. Many Christians give far too much power to Satan as if he still has his kingdom and as if he's still in charge. What we don't understand is that he has no kingdom. At the very moment of the death of Jesus Christ is the very moment of the defeat of Satan. Why? Because in the garden when Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. Take this cup away from me, Father, but not my will, but your will be done. A human being chooses to do the will of the Father in the most extreme circumstances that you can ever imagine. Adam and Eve chose to do their will in ordinary circumstances. Jesus chooses to do the will of the Father in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And, and in choosing to do the will of the Father, he surrenders his will to the Father's will. And humility comes back to the fore. And he so empties himself that in his act of dying is his final act of emptying of himself. There is nothing of him and therefore there is nothing for Satan to lay hold on. And therefore, Satan has nothing more anymore. And he is defeated because it is love for why it was the purpose for Jesus' death. And it was out of love that he gives himself totally. And Satan cannot hold on to love. And he has nothing to hold because there is no ego. There's total emptiness because there is a total gift of Jesus to the Father. And, and in that moment of death, Satan is completely undone absolutely undone. And all that Satan has now is the sham of power by fearing, by bringing us to fear, by, by tempting us, by, by seducing, by, by all the external means. But, but he has no real power. And that is what the Holy Spirit must reveal. That the prince of this world has been undone through the cross of Jesus Christ on the cross and his death, and his giving himself completely to, to the Father. And that's why even at the moment before he dies, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's an act of pure love. Pure, pure, pure love. And so these, these three things that are, are put forward, proven by the refusal of them to believe in me, about who was right by my going to the Father, and sending and seeing me know about judgment, proved by the prince of this world being already condemned. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. So just look for a moment at your own life. And where are you on your spiritual journey? Do you really believe that Jesus is the one to believe in? And that your belief in him leads to faith that he is God? And faith that it is only by his name and by him that you can be saved. And if that's hard for you to believe, then you need the Holy Spirit. Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why he's sending another advocate. That's why the advocate is coming to teach us these, these fundamentals to the truth. And the fundamentals to the faith. About righteousness. That Jesus was the righteous one about the prince of this world being already condemned. It is in this that we start understanding that the role of the Spirit is not an ancillary role, is not auxiliary, is not if you like, you need, or if you need, you ask. This is that without the Holy Spirit, the disciples would have never journeyed through the upper room to the risen faith in Jesus Christ and through Pentecost to the giving of themselves as fearless giving in the witness martyrdom to Christ.